You're listening to the Co-Creator Network. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Good afternoon. Welcome to Why Shamanism Now, a practical path to authenticity with your host, Christina Pratt. Director of the Last Mask Center for Shamanic Healing. She's talking about how shamanic skills can bring us to physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being, especially when nothing else can. Now, here's your host, Christina Pratt. So welcome, everyone, to Why Shamanism Now. This is your host, Christina Pratt, and I'd like to begin by calling in the helping spirits to be with us here today. So I call out first to your ancestors and to mine. I call out to those who bring all that is good and true and beautiful in our ancestral lines into our lives. Those who are ready, willing, and able already to perform as ancestral helping spirits for us in a way that allows the living to learn from those who have gone before us. And we ask these ancestral helping spirits to remember well that they might step into our lives when necessary and help us to innovate and change and move on and not continue to make the same mistakes in new ways in our own time. We ask these ancestral helping spirits to stand true behind us, to hold us well, and to help us to do what must be done for those who are coming. And let us reach beyond our attachment to being human, beyond these ancestors, even in their great numbers as they gather around us, and reach out to those older ancestors, those who are older than humanity, those who populate our earth with us, and who have deeper and older things to teach us that help us to resonate with the deeper energies within ourselves and to more easily tune in to the path of our soul in this lifetime to become less distracted by this and that and the shiny things of contemporary life and to tune in deeply to the real energies here that are moving the deeper things that matter to our heart that matter to our soul and matter deeply to life here on earth and so we ask these helping spirits in their many forms those energies of nature to be with us here in a strong way that we can remember how to be the humans that were dreamt into this great web of life to bring blessing and to bring song and to bring a quality of life that is unique to humanity and let us be those people in our time and as all of these ancestral helping spirits in their many forms gather around us here today let us draw our own in and from wherever it might be at this moment take a nice deep breath and draw it into our heads another breath and draw it into our hearts another breath and draw it into our bellies another breath and send it deep down into the earth and let's take a moment in this day to stop all the multitasking and all the thinking and all the moving about of the day and just be for a moment with the earth in our mind perhaps if we can to touch the earth and to simply give thanks for this day thanks for life for beauty for wonder thanks for diversity thanks for the possibility of change and thanks for the ability to change anything that we choose to as long as we are still breathing. We give gratitude to the earth for this generosity in her dreaming. And we give thanks for the wonder of life itself. And with this gratitude in our hearts, let it begin to pour out into all of the layers of the earth as we begin to move our energy down to the very center of the earth, reaching through all the layers, drawing our energy deeply into our bodies and into the earth and into the very center where we ground our energy And tune in for a moment to that which draws its strength and its essence from silence and stillness, from darkness, that which restores, renews, and replenishes. That energy before, all that rises to the earth in abundance, all that supports life begins deeply in this place before. And let us draw that energy in and draw it up into our bodies drawing up the energy to refresh and renew and nourish us in this day, to restore our sense of this being a new day, and to help us to be revitalized for the challenges the day has for us. And with this energy of the earth rising up our grounding cord and into our bodies, let us ask that energy to teach us, help us to understand how to be in our bodies, how to be manifest in form in a good way, to know where we stand, what we stand for, and to build our sense of home, 
our sense of life around that and let us open the doors of our home to those who think differently than we do who are other than us and to invite them in that in respectful discussion and exchange that we might be provoked to become the men and women that we've really come here to be so let us be open to that which is other than we are just as the entire ecosystems that cover the earth are all about very different forms very different functions moving through their way of life in a way that connects and interconnects and creates this great web of life and let us tune in in some way at some point in this day hopefully deeply enough to be blessed to feel ourself as part of that great web and may we take right relationship from that connection so with the energy of the earth filling us let us rise up in our awareness from our belly to our heart and our heart to our mind drawing the earth's energy up until it rises up into the sky and whatever weather it holds for you here today imagine yourself feeling this energy and the energy feeling you as you reach up through the atmosphere and out in the cosmos and all the way up to the highest power of the universe in whatever way you know that energy by whatever name you call it call out to it reach to connect with it and let it connect with you and draw this energy down into yourself into your day into these proceedings and in this way we all draw in the energy of blessing and protection into our lives we call in the benevolence of our universe and use that energy to feel the energy of commitment and devotion we call in this energy that illuminates the way that inspires us when we have lost hope that which can be that tiny light in the darkness guiding us into the unknown on a new path we call these energies in and all of the beneficence of our universe we draw these energies into our body and send them down to the center of the earth opening up the center channel of our body and filling it with the energy of earth and sky these two great legendary lovers and we allow the big love of this this great relationship of legend to open up our heart to fill our heart and to invite the spirit of our own heart to join this day fully and may the crucible of the heart be awakened by all of this energy moving through us and may that crucible of transformation draw up the fiery passions of the belly that do have a deep knowing of why you are here and call down the crystal clarity of the mind that is here engaged in your place and your time we draw these energies together in the heart and let them dance a wild and passionate dance together neither one overpowering the other but each finding a way together to give birth through that dynamic tension to the third and sacred thing that your heart holds for you which is some sense or knowing perhaps a memory of why you are here and may you find in that very same human heart the courage that you need to do something in this day large or small to bring those gifts physically into the world and for the enormous amount of spirit help that we have to do this i give great thanks and as these energies gather around i also want to give thanks to the people who help me keep the show um, live on the air in the archives and free to those who have the ability to access it through a computer so i give thanks to ginger and suzanne to douglas malama susan and william and all of the listeners who have been able to donate financially to the show if you're listening for the first time why shaman why shamanism now is listener supported which means it's because of the generous donations of people like you listening who give to the show because they've been moved by the show in some way They've been moved in the heart, not always necessarily to a happy place, sometimes to a place of frustration and irritation, but nonetheless, they have been moved. And I ask you all to do that most fundamental of shamanic acts, which is to allow that which moves your heart to motivate your actions in the world and to do something to help the show to grow. And if you'd like to donate to the show, you can go to whyshamanismnow.com, go to the support button scroll down and you can donate any amount large or small in any currency we are happy for all of it and appreciate it all because it goes directly to keeping the show on the air and i mean that literally um and uh, for the other things that you can do and it's important as shamanic people that we begin to understand we live in a resource rich environment finances are only one of those many resources there's many things that we can do with our time and our energy and our heart that are deeply important resources and so there's much you can show to grow 
um, to bring the ideas into your journey circles, to share them with your other chronic friends and all the many, many, many ways that we can make ourselves better able together to bring shamanic skills into practical application in our contemporary lives. And for all of these efforts from all of you, I am deeply grateful. So we are not live today. However, if you would like to email me about the show, you can email me at Christina at lastmaskcenter.org. So I'd like to welcome our guest today. This is part of our series about different kinds of helping spirits. And today we're going to be talking about working with deities and archetypes. And so I've invited our guest Langston Kahn to join us to talk about this with me. Welcome, Langston. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. So Langston is a shamanic practitioner specializing in emotional clearing and radical transformation. He stands firmly at the crossroads, his practice informed by Western modality of inner relationship focusing, initiations into traditions of the African diaspora, and the contemporary shamanic tradition of Last Mass Center, and the guidance of his own helping spirits and ancestors, helping him to weave it all together as a true contemporary shaman. Langston has studied and facilitated inner relationship focusing developed by Anne Weiser Cornell for the last eight years, and he has completed the five years of training with me um, in the cycle of transformation and also serves as a leader in our leadership council and last mass community. And that is, of course, as you all know from listening to the show, a community of contemporary people striving to live in alignment with ancient shamanic beliefs and principles in a way that answers the unique challenges of our time. Langston also holds initiations in several um, traditions of the Af- African diaspora. Um, he is centered in New York City, though he speaks to us today from London. Thank you, technology. Um, and he offers sessions in emotional clearing and shamanic healing um, and classes, both in person and online. And he will be offering his next online emotional clearing class in July. So if you'd like to reach Langston, you can go to his fabulous new website at occupy-your-heart.com or you can email him at Langston, L-A-N-G-S-T-O-N. It's very phonetic. It's easy. Langston at occupy-your-heart.com. Uh, so Langston, I'm very excited to talk about two kinds of helping spirits that are near and dear to my heart, although I think of these energies as not necessarily helping spirits in the traditional sense, but more as other types of energy that are happy, thank goodness, <laughs> to work <laughs> with us as helping spirits. Um, but I also wanted to share with people that um, part of the reason that I, everybody, part of the reason that I've asked Langston to join me is because he just finished presenting and moderating at the first conference of psychoanalysis, art, and the occult. Um, and Langston's presentation at the conference was entitled, The Thing That Knowledge Can't Eat, Engaging the Power of Archetypes and Deities for Radical Transformation exploring the seven souls so um langston is one of the people that i will actually go to if i have challenges with my own clients or students um and the energies that they're working with particularly if they're working with deities that langston's kind of my go-to person to to bounce things off and try to understand where's the the hitch and the get along that's causing the problems this person is experiencing, which is usually happening because they're treating a deity or an archetype um, purely as a regular old garden variety helping spirit, and thus things are going awry. So anyway, so <laughs> Langston, uh, in my world at least, Langston's a great resource for these particular uh, types of helping spirits. So. So we're talking today then about these two types of beings who are willing to engage with us as helping spirits, though I might not consider them traditional um, helping spirits um, because they also serve other functions beyond what a normal helping spirit serves, deities and archetypes. So Langston, when you think of a deity, um, what you know? What what um what attributes um are required to be able to think of these invisible some invisible energy as a deity? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I mean, I think it's always very hard to delineate between deity and spirit, especially when you're first encountering something outside of any context, like it's just an energy that you're encountering. Oftentimes, sometimes it feels like the only delineation is that they're bigger. <laughs> that it's a, that's a very big <laughs> energy that you're encountering. Um, but 
I think it's almost most helpful to rather than what it is, 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 uh, noticing what it's not. Um, I think often people, uh, people encounter deities very frequently because of their attraction to them. They might hear a story or a myth about that deity. They might attend some sort of ritual or gathering where that deity is being honored or, or they might just read about that deity online or in a book. And then they start wanting to engage with that energy. I think experience deities engaging with them without them seeking them out actually are, are rarer than, say, your garden variety, just helping spirits that everyone should have with them. Um, so I think oftentimes it's less that people are having trouble differentiating between deities and other types of spirits. It's more that when they do start working with a deity, they might, um, well, I think actually for most people, it's not even that they're putting onto that deity the idea that they're helping spirit, but they're kind of often putting onto that deity the, what they're looking for from, say, a parental figure, I see more mm-hmm. often than not. Um, like wanting that deity to be, and, and also, of, of course, that comes very much from, I think, Christian or uh, various Semitic ideologies, where you see this, like, you know, benevolent, all powerful, omniscient, deity that only has your best interest at heart or uh, as long as you're following all their rules <laughs> and or, so when people take that um conception to any other deity outside of that context i think there there can be the potential for a lot of confusion and harm because the average deity doesn't want you to think of them as your parent they want you to be um they, they think that you're going to be, you know, honoring your own boundaries and, and so they'll honor their boundaries and you can negotiate together and they're expecting you to approach them in that way. Whereas I think often because the energy of a deity is so big and people sometimes romanticize them or get sort of an idea of a deity, sort of wanting to step into that sort of mythic landscape, when they start engaging the deity and they get a sense that a deity is asking them for something, it feels very, um, it makes them feel special or important. And that often is when people start to not have the boundaries they maybe should have in place, or the protocols they might want to have in place that they would know if they were in a culture that was traditionally already had a long history and relationship of working with these particular energies. Um, yeah. So it's so it, part of the thing I think that's really important about deities is recognizing that to just go to them and assume this sort of neutral, compassionate position that we can mostly safely assume from our helping spirits, like animals or plant helping spirits, um, is folly. <laughs> With <laughs> deities. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, cause I think deities have their own agenda. Um, and this isn't to say that's a bad thing. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. It's just like you wouldn't want to engage with a friend, make a friendship with someone who had no will or desires of their own. Just like de- deities also, um, because they're more wrapped up in human life and human stories and human relationships, um, they do also have this, this very, uh, what you might think of as human sense of agency and will in the world and, and missions to carry out. And those missions or, or agendas may or may not be in alignment with the agendas of your soul, what you came here to do in this life. And I think oftentimes because of the overwhelm of this huge, immense, powerful energy paying attention to you, people sometimes forget their own agenda and agency and purpose and, and true you know, duty and obligation of living that purpose in that relationship. And that you need to make sure that what the deity is wanting is in alignment with that and also that uh, you have clear terms that you're working from, so there's no misunderstandings later on. Just like when you were creating a business relationship with someone, you'd want to have a contract. So, um, just to be, <laughs> be really clear, because this is a very important point about working with deities, especially if you're coming at it from an honest and sincere ignorance of this deity. You know, you're not coming at it because this is. Um, well, so for example, in a recent session, Hanneman came in really strong. For those of you that don't know, this is a kind of a monkey, god, trickstery sort of character. And I had no idea whether this very young girl who even knew who I was talking about. <laughs> and and I kept saying, are, you know, are you sure, really? I mean, do I really have to, you know, this, she's 14, you know? <laughs> and it was really, really clear. And, and I told her, I asked her about that part of the session. And do you know who, and she goes, oh, oh yeah, this whole half of my family. Um, honors Hanneman as their primary, you know, sort of 
saint in a sense, their primary spirit, their go-to spirit, and they leave offerings at the temple all the time in India and blah, 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 blah. I was like, oh, phew, you know. <laughs> you know, thank goodness she's got people in her life who, who can teach her how to work with this um, helping spirit who was coming in uh, to her life to work with her actually in her martial practice. So it was very, mm. it was very interesting. All this, it's like, oh man, she's fourteen. Come on, really? <laughs> but, but it'll be beautiful for her. Um, so anyway, what I was saying is, helping spirits, you know, traditional shamanic helping spirits, especially our totem spirit, you know, as I use the word totem spirit, are there to to support us in living our soul's purpose, and they have no purpose other than being there with us and helping us to manifest you know the best human being that we can manifest and the most robust and abundant manifestations of our soul's purpose and that the, the simplicity of that relationship i know for example in my life is is what has taught me how to have good boundaries you know what does it mean to be in right relationship with something and it's only in the in the simplicity of being in relationship with a powerful being who wants me to be in my power and do what I came here to do that I can understand that but then if we ramp that up to a deity that has its own story it has its own life for lack of a better word uh, though in the invisible world but it's got a long history with people and it's not a neutral spirit and most deities are complex enough enough to not to have sides to them that are not necessarily compassionate Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think, yeah, so I think that we do a disservice really to deities when we approach them as wanting to be that benevolent um, figure that, that is sort of a parental figure. Um, not that there can't be deities that do have those aspects as well, these nurturing, mothering or fathering aspects, but even in those relationships, that sense of personal power and boundary and, and sovereignty, for lack of a better word, is, is important. Um, but I think it's, it's, interesting too you mentioned the uh, Hanuman experience that you had in the session because I think that brings also up the point of that another difference I think between your average like you know crow spirit coming to help you out um, versus say the Morgan coming to help you out or um, another another type of deity associated with with crows uh, is that some of these deities have first of all some of them have long histories and and that that we know about so there's there's ways that they're used to working with humans that you can do research about um, to work with them in a good way. So you get to understand their specific symbolic language, their way of understanding protocol and and what they're expecting, might be expecting from you as reciprocity for what they're doing for you. Um, but also some of these deities are part of living traditions. Um, and so, so, for example, Hanuman, in, in that case, I think it's very important then for people to... If, if, if it just a random person was, was approaching, saying, oh, I think Hanuman's really cool, I want to work with them, um, even if that deity is authentically approaching you, you might want to seek out practitioners who are already um, have a history and are part of the culture that that deity arises out of. So you're not just um, sort of operating in your own fantasy zone with the deity, but have, are, are, have your experience grounded in people that already have a long, rich history with this force and have been tending it for a long time. Which is also a piece of, of being um, conscious in all of this work when we start to move into cultural context of not just appropriating things. Like, you know, mm -hmm. there's an article recently about, you know, our gods are not a vending machine. You know, mm -hmm. that, you know that, that, <laughs> that these... In other words, these deities belong. They belong to people and that they're not there for anybody who wants to just grab them and that it's important for us to respect those people and those traditions and and how we go about connecting with the deity also requires in a sense that we connect with the people and the history and the traditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a sense with those – like you, you never – you can only gain – from that process. I think often people, maybe they don't want to take the time or there's fear of trying to approach people from another culture or with another context than your own. Um, so you just kind of want to take the shiny spiritual thing and not actually engage with the people um, that have a very intimate relationship with that thing. But I think then you lose out on huge swaths of that energy that you're wanting to work with because so much of it is wrapped up in with the stories of the people, with the experiences of the people. Like, like for example, in Haitian Vodou, 
with the Lua. Um, and Lua is kind of a, maybe perhaps a, a misleading term in this conversation because really Lua in, in Haiti means helping spirit. So, <laughs> but, but, but because in our context, what we know as Lua is these specific um, ancestral sort of deities of that culture. Um, so it, when you try to just sort of cherry pick one of those deities and are, aren't working with them in the community context, you're missing out on a huge part of that deity because their energy functions within the dynamic of community. All of Haitian Voodoo is all about community. So it's just, I think it's just always important. When, another thing to think about when you're working with a deity is, is this a living tradition? If so, how can I connect with other practitioners who are working within this living tradition in a respectful way? And if it's not a living tradition, then what, what, can I, what other resources do I have to explore how humans might have related to this deity in the past or how this deity is used to relating to humans? And th- this is uh, it, it, this is not exactly the same point, but it's it's um, re- reminding me of uh, a, a kind of a related issue because in not doing this, not only as you've said, Langston, can we only gain from that because this is all about learning um, life. It's all about learning. You know, not only can we gain from that exploration and learning how people that are different than us conceive of things and engage with things like spirit and what does it mean to them to to be better humans. You know that, that we can only only gain from that and within that um, because of the protocol and because of the history with certain helping spirits we can get ourselves into trouble in the same way we can create trouble for ourselves when we're calling out for help again and again and again but not really allowing our helping spirit in that very dynamic can cause illness Mm-hmm. In the same way, similarly, with, with the deity not understanding there's certain things that are expected as we pull that relationship in and it starts working and we don't do these expected things, there can be what appears to us to be problems. Mm-hmm. And so, so for, for example, which is a little bit now blending our ideas today with the whole deity and archetype thing, mm-hmm. so we work with an archetype that we call Crazy Woman. And she is about um, chaos and the mess that we can create in life and finding the, the eye in that storm to continue to function as a skillful practitioner in the hardest places in life to be skillful. And um, she is manifest in many people's um, cultural pantheons of their deities. So she is manifest in Durga. She is manifest in Kali. She is manifest in Pele. I mean, she is manifest in these destroyer goddesses um, around the globe in many, many different people. And yet she is not, she's been very clear, she is not those specific manifestations. But what's important about it is that as cultural deities, these goddesses um, almost always require blood sacrifice and still today. And what's interesting about working with Crazy Woman is someone always bleeds in the <laughs> retreats where we work with. Is Someone always cuts themselves. It's usually me, but somebody bleeds. And, and so the important thing is when that happens to go, ah, here is the sacrifice to Crazy Woman. Here, here is the blood offering and to, and to give it as a sacrifice so that it's done so that everybody doesn't have to keep happening unconscious, you know, so it doesn't have to, another person cuts themselves another, you know, until it, it gets worse and worse and worse um, because it's not being acknowledged as the sacrifice that it is. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, the offering isn't being made as an offering. It's just being treated as an accident. And so this is another caution, I think, that in working with deities is really understanding the dynamic of that relationship and educating yourself. And, and then also not even with all that education to not be arrogant enough to say that I am a practitioner of a particular uh, cultural form of occult work just because I'm working with one helping spirit – I mean one deity from their pantheon <laughs> – I mean, we have to, you know, and just because Raven shows up doesn't mean you're connected to Odin. <laughs> it could just be Raven, you know. So that whole, it, it's almost like a greediness. You know, these things associate and my, like you said, my mind just wants to connect all the shiny things instead of actually doing the work step by step to build these relationships with these different energies as they are and for who they are and, and, and for why they've connected with us in our lives. 
Um, okay, so speaking of crazy woman, let's talk about archetype. So when you use that term, Langston, what because this term, I mean, I think Jung probably rolls over in his grave regularly. <laughs> <laughs> Poor man. <laughs> For the many ways that this term is used. Um, so when you're when you're talking about something as an archetypal energy, Langston, how how are you thinking about that? What makes something an archetype? Yeah, well, I think it's interesting to talk about Jung rolling in his grave because I think that he actually frequently said even during his life that people were misunderstanding what he meant when he said the word archetype. So, so I think even then he was frustrated with the, the concept that he had viscerally experienced that he was trying to explain to people that they were just not understanding. And so I actually, in the more I've read about his understanding of archetypes, the more I think that the sort of last mask way of talking about archetypes is actually much closer to his original intention. Because when he was coming up with these terms, you know, sort of shortly after his uh, explorations with the Red Book, um, where he's recording all of these experiences he's having in his inner landscape with helping spirits. Um, he's having experiences like the prophet Elijah coming to him and screaming at him, I am not in your mind. I am not a concept. And he's also <laughs> having experiences like... Uh, and a, and a Baptist dead, hordes of Anabaptist dead coming through his kitchen. Um, and and uh, so for him, and he actually writes about this, the archetype has both an internal and an external sort of cosmic, what he called, I think, the ultraviolet component to it. Um, and so I think how I would describe archetypes the same way, that there are these cosmic energies, and this is, of course, what I really, I didn't work with archetypes in this way before, my studies of the last mass centers is very much um, your concept, but the, the idea that archetypes are older than the gods, in a sense, that they're these building blocks of the universe, these very cosmic energies that are, we can engage with um, through our inner version of that archetypal energy, which really, like for example, our inner healer, which really is simply an illustration of the highest conception we can have at that time of that energy, the, the deepest level of engagement we can have with this cosmic big energy. And then we work over time to deepen our relationship with that energy and expand our capacity to really be with it and see it and allow it to flow through us. And in that process, that image, that inner archetype changes and shapeshifts over time. So for example, when I first started working with my inner healer, it showed up as this giant floating angelic figure, this being of like with these big light wings and it had a hood over its face, it was all in shadow. And for me, that was because at that time, I didn't realize it until later, but at that time, uh, my mom is a very gifted healer. Uh, my dad is a Buddhist priest. So I had these experiences and understanding of healing, but I had no grounded healing practice in my own life. And the minute I actually started to really take that practice into my body and ground it and, and work with that archetype in a deep way, then eventually after a few months, the, the angel landed on the ground. He took off his cloak and so now he had a face and he was Jesus. And uh, I'm not Christian. I wasn't raised Christian, but uh, there was something about the heart and healing that I needed to learn about at that time. And then over time, that shapeshifted too into a, one of my primary helping spirits because that was my highest level of conceiving of the energy of healing at that time. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that there are these vast energies that we can only engage with as much as we can engage with them at, at a time. And so we have to continually ask questions of them, be working with them and engaging with them. And in the doing of that, it allows us them to shift and change and us to engage deeper with them. And, um, you know, I'm hearing all of these new journeyers go, oh, shit. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I'm just trying to get a handle on whether this is like a raven or a crow, and now it's going to start changing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but the important thing about this is even with our helping spirits, that that growth of the relationship is true. It's always about the relationship and and feeling your energy in relationship with this other energy so in so like in Langston's story so the healer energy stays consistent 
it's kind of like water filling different vessels. It's still mm-hmm. that essence of that energy, but it's taking on um, kind of more, more and more conscious forms as we are capable of rising to that consciousness ourselves, knowing, of course, that it's always more than that. Exactly. But the truth and I is, think, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say that, that and, and in that, I was always specifically calling in my inner healer and then seeing who showed up. So it wasn't like, oh, no, there's this energy appearing for me. What is this? Is this my inner healer? It was, I was in a place where I was in, so as part of the emotional clearing techniques, I was bringing in this energy and then noticing who came. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes it was the same, and then over time then it changed as well. And that's the other thing is this isn't random willy-nilly like they have different outfits in their closet. You know, this is evolving over time, you know, at, I mean time, months, potentially years as Langston's relationship with the energy is changing. And this is one of the things that I think is so um, – uh, for me, really nourishing and constantly supports my ability to maintain qualities like hope and possibility when everything looks like it's going to hell in a handbasket because these these are the true code. They are the, the, the structure, which is why they're in us because we're part of this. You know, everything that's here has that energy in it. You know, we call it healer, but that doesn't mean my cedar tree calls it healer. It calls it something in tree language, but trees still heal. You know, so this this energy is inherent in everything. So of course, it's in us and out there. Um, um, but I also understand Jung's frustration because it's very much like the shamanic frustration of you can't understand it until you've done it. Mm-hmm. There's so much you can't understand until you've had the experience to then begin to sort out your understanding based on that experience. It can't, you know, like like the beautiful title of your of your talk that you gave is this, this we're all talking about things knowledge can't eat <laughs> so we can't yeah. get there just through our knowledge but anyway the one thing i was going to say is one of my favorite stories from a traditional um inuit shaman was about how his primary helping spirits over the the many many decades of his practice as he no longer needed them to have forms because he recognized the vibration for lack of a better word the quality of their energy and was in such rich relationship with them they just stopped having any form at all they were just energy and he could just feel oh this is this is my great grandmother and this is um you know polar bear and you know he could just feel that energy and they no longer took form and so you know even with our helping spirits i think we have a tendency to latch on to our to, to our need for those faces and and part of the long-term possibility of our relationship with spirit is to grow out of that need ourselves i mean they really are just doing it for us absolutely I mean, yeah just, and i think yeah. i Go think ahead. it's interesting how you're talking about the sort of the gods are not vending machines article and uh, i think that impulse the more the more i've worked with these energies and and experienced those type of rituals people are treating the gods like vending machines in terms of like, who are we going to call on tonight? We need a healing ritual um, where people might be calling on a deity that they have no actual intimate relationship with, but are just trying to use them in a sort of very sort of like capitalistic society way. Like, like I need this function to perform, so I'm going to use this thing to perform this function as a tool. Um, I think that comes sometimes out of a lack of engagement with archetypal energies uh, uh, and having this instinct that, we need to call on something bigger than human in this moment, but then the only thing they know to go to is the gods. So then they treat the gods as just an energy they can call down instead of as an entity that you need to develop a relationship with to work with in a good way or in a skillful way. And, and you know, and, and we should probably talk about, you know, how, how do we do that, both with deities and archetypes, um, because one of the things that I notice with both as we as we want to begin to work with them and you know, realize for us as humans to realize that um, this is so hard for humans to get because we're so divisive right now in our in our manifestation on earth, but they mm-hmm. all see us as humanity. So I, Christina, who you know have done nothing um, out of out out of relationship with this energy, 
I still have a kind of responsibility when I first greet them in their eyes for what humanity has done. So, mm. so many of the archetypal energies are pretty denigrated and misunderstood and, and treated badly um, through monothe- the lens of monotheistic um, religions, for example. And so in a sense, we're all out of good relationship with them. If we just look at humanity being out of good relationship with them. And so when we greet them and want to begin to work with them, one of the first things we actually really need to ask is, so what needs to happen for me to get into right relationship with you is, you know, that we, and we may owe debts because our ancestors did. Mm-hmm. And it's just been handed down the line. And so it also, the, the problem with the vending machine idea is like I just showed up the ritual and I brought my potluck dish. So now I get to have access to these deities. You know? <laughs> like, it doesn't really work that way. It, you know, they've been around for a long time and there's a lot of um, problematic uh, dynamics with a lot of these helping spirits. And that there's – for me, I felt like there was a um, ability to stand my ground and negotiate – take responsibility for what I was in a sense guilty of and Mm -hmm. to say, you know, that's not mine. I, you know, I can't be responsible for all of humanity, especially today. Um, but I can go forward, but I can use that to inform me to go forward in a different way with you. Um, I mean, I can avoid that mistake, but I didn't, you know, (laughs) it's like you can only take responsibility for so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It requires being honest about what you really are guilty for in just sort of the laziness of particularly Western thought around gods and deities and archetypal energies. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think that comes back to sort of the having adult boundaries. It's really hard to have that sense of what am I responsible, what I'm not responsible for. If you don't have those adult boundaries in places you're engaging with these entities. Um, And I think sometimes people, people can get the sort of shamanic playpen quote unquote version of the uh, gods when you don't have those adult boundaries in place. So there is some protection sometimes of the sort of ignorance is bliss. Like you mm-hmm. could like, sure, maybe, maybe nothing really dramatic changes or, or good happens, but nothing really bad happens either. It's just like, okay, I tried this and it didn't work. Um, but if you're hungry for that deeper level engagement, I think it is very important to think about, um, like you said, debts, like not just, I think, yeah, that's a really great point about what does, what is humanity responsible for that need to maybe at least make an apology for but also, um, yeah, what debts might I have from another life? And I don't think it's, it's something that we need to be uh, worrying about, but it's something that maybe on a first experience with that deity, a first contact, you might want to be asking as you're developing, seeking to develop that good relationship, like, is there any debt I need to clear with you before we can have a relationship and work together in a good way? I think that's very important with both helping spirits and deities, honestly. Um, because, yeah, there's a lot that happens in between lives that can be <laughs> uh, show up at, uh, if we're not asking those questions and, and can cause a lot of issues. At least certainly in my life, I've, I've experienced issues like that. And, I, and, and on this topic of, of debt, I also want to say is it's important to not project human feelings onto these energies. It's not that they're mad at you because of the debt. I, mm. I, I actually do get pretty grumpy <laughs> when people are out of good relationship with me around exchange and people get grumpy with me. And there's a reason for that, that, that ugh, feeling about it is part of how we know it wasn't a right exchange. But mm. the helping spirits or that the archetypes, the deities, the helping spirits, it's not that they necessarily hold something emotionally negative to you like a human being would. It's that they can't operate, that we can't access their what they have to offer fully when there's a hairball in the pipe you know Mm -hmm. we're the hairball right Mm -hmm. so we have to keep um keep that channel clear so that what it is that we're asking from them can actually pass through and we're the ones in physical form we're the ones that have to clear clear that way so that they can because if someone basically keeps asking for my help but but blocks any way for me to help them. Eventually, I'm going to just get – I'm going to get so frustrated, I'm going to step away. Mm-hmm. And that's essentially what we're doing with them by not thinking about the quality and the openness of the relationship is we're asking for their help but then tying their hands to give it to us. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I also have seen some people experiencing harm because they are in debt to a deity because, you know, there's certain sort of – I don't know that I could say exactly what they are, but there do seem to be certain rules for human and deity engagement and interaction. 
And I think the times in which I see those rules being broken, even when the person is from coming from a place of ignorance and they, they're, they're quite honestly just have no idea um, what's going on is often because of debt um, that the deity then is aware of, but the human isn't. The deity thinks they should be understanding what is owed to that deity. So they might be experiencing ill effects from that deity's influence until when they try to engage with that energy until they are able to clear that debt. So it's another reason I just feel like asking that question is always a good place to start. Or um, if you're experiencing problems like that, engaging with the deity, then maybe approaching a practitioner that either works with that deity or a shamanic practitioner that could help you to um, look into that situation. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what do you think are kind of the basic Okay, so let's say we've got listeners that are like, oh, crap, I've got a deity who's been talking to me and I've been treating them like a regular helping spirit. <laughs> you know, so what, what would you say are kind of the basic sort of fundamental kinds of like that question to ask about am I in debt? But just how do you approach a deity in a good way it, to, to create a good working relationship? I mean, mm-hmm. what's kind of unique to a deity other than the obvious respect and all that stuff? Yeah. Well, I think the first, the first thing that's unique protocol, like we've been talking about, about deities are tied up in human stories. So if it's a deity that no longer has a living tradition around it, then approaching um, practitioners who have already successfully been working with that deity, if you can find them, or reading and researching as much as you can about that deity. Um, it's sometimes difficult to find books that are from a practitioner standpoint. Like you might, it might also involve a lot of historical research or scholarly research. Um, but that willingness to take that time to understand the history of this energy you're working with and not just think, oh, because we're in an era where we're all ascending and now we can just do whatever we want with any energy in the universe. I think that's approaching a deity as a child. Um, And so I think the the basic first step is just research. Do do your research, whether that be talking to people, whether that be reading texts, or whether that be engaging with people that are part of a living tradition that that deity is a part of. and then after research, I think if you're just experiencing a deity contacting you, um, whether that be through dreams, through symbols you keep see showing up, through um, hearing a voice, uh, then in that case, it might be good to maybe make an initial offering if you have a sense of what that is as an offering. And just in that space that's sort of opened up in that act of gratitude being offered and acknowledgement being offered, asking some questions if you can, if you if you are in a place where you can get responses back. Um, and that might be questions like, um, so I'm curious, why would you like to work with me? Like not just assuming, oh, this deity is working with me, what a blessing. Um, but to, but being curious about why, why now, why is this deity wanting to work with me and getting a, if you can, getting a clear sense of that. Who are you? And noticing that that deity's symbolic language, no, noticing if you do already have a sense of who that deity is, then sensing into what aspect in particular of that deity is approaching me at this time. Because just like, and maybe this is again muddling things a bit, but just the way archetypes can shape it over time as you work with them and take on different symbols to illustrate them, deities often are vast beings. So they many dimensions to their expressions and many aspects which are often uh well, often illustrated by their followers through epithets for example the deity hecate um one of her epithets is nurse made of young boys one of her eth- met- one of her epithets is um queen of the great below those two epithets are probably very different from each other <laughs> so you might want to mm-hmm. sense into who what 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 part of this deity is approaching me at this time and why um Another question you might want to ask is what we talked about earlier. Um, Are there any debts that need to be cleared before I can work with you in a good way? If so, what are they? And then finally, I think a very important thing is just having a clear sense of boundaries in terms of what are you willing to do with this deity? What are you not willing to do? If you're asking for something from that deity, not treating them as the sort of source that you energy that you pray to and you just like, you know, pour your heart out and ask for all these things. But maybe if you're asking something specific, maybe saying, if you are giving me this thing, then I would be willing to give you this thing. And then divining, if you have a divination tool to sense, is that an acceptable um, exchange? 
with that deity. Just the same way, again, if you were starting a business with someone, you'd want a clear contract of for negotiating the work. And if all this sounds overwhelming or, or too hard to do, then I think it would be suggested to work with a diviner or a shamanic practitioner um, that could help you to engage in that specific negotiation. So I think that for me, that's what, yeah. Yeah, and I think one thing I would add to that is, is if we truly are, especially if it's not a no longer a living tradition, um, you know, humility and just saying, I, I understand I am completely ignorant of the mm-hmm. right way to come to you. And I know there is a right way to come to you. Would you be willing to help me learn again by, by just telling me what you want? You know? yeah. I mean, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes that'll work uh, and sometimes it doesn't. But, but especially for traditions where you say, I would go to your people, but I don't know who they are anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, they may all be dead. They mm-hmm. may all be gone. So I can't go to your people. You know, I mean, so, you know, that, 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 um, to be willing to negotiate, which of course comes back to why, even though journeying is a shamanic tool, it's a helpful tool for other kinds of practice with deities or archetypes because it allows us to actually go have these conversations. Absolutely. And, and, and instead of trying to get this information through some kind of yes-no divination tool, which can be really infuriating when you can't figure out what the right question is because that's mm. the whole point, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah and I, th- I think that's an incredibly important point about humility and the willingness to ask. And I, I didn't – yeah um, – I think that's honestly what saved Jung in his experiences because he was he was never trying to categorize his experiences or label his experiences that were happening. If you read the Red Book, there are no psychological terms that he uses to describe the experiences that he's having. He's simply engaging with what's coming and he's asking the spirits again and again to explain themselves, to explain why they're there, to explain what they're wanting from him in that moment. And then he's listening, and then he's taking actions based on those explanations, and he's creating art um, to engage with those energies, and he's like, you know, creating towers and inscribing bricks, and just constantly um, li- asking, listening to the answer, and and interpreting that answer, and then acting on that interpretation, and then seeing how the world responds, and then coming back to the energy. And I think that's I also just like with any helping spirit, that's one of the most important ways to start to refine our sense of these energies um, and it's something else I also didn't say was uh, shrine building can be very helpful even if it's a temporary shrine simply like laying out a cloth that you feel resonates with you and that with the energy of that deity putting out some ob- objects that you know are associated with that with that deity that is an invocation of that presence in and of itself and can be very helpful when you're working a, working on refining your contact with that energy. And it also, again, helps to delineate those boundaries. When you make a physical space in your home or, or wherever you are um, for that presence in your life, then you have a specific place where you can go to to relate to that energy. And sometimes that can have an effect of stopping it from bleeding into every aspect of your life. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it can intensify the energy as well, but... Um, it, it still is a place where you can symbolically engage with that energy through through the physical, which can be very helpful and useful. So in terms of cultivating a relationship, relationship with an archetypal energy that will function with you as a helping spirit, um, how would you kind of compare and contrast that to what we just said about deity? So the one thing is less involvement. You know, so in other words, if I if I connect with Crazy Woman instead of Durga, now I don't I don't have all that cultural stuff that would go with Durga. I can just go to this code, this energy that's that doesn't have a cultural story around it yet. Mm-hmm. So that there's a certain simplicity in that. Mm-hmm. But but are there other things that you would say just in terms of cultivating relationship with uh, our, our, uh, kind of a right relationship with the archetypes? I mean, the first, the most important thing you've already said, which is allowing their form to change in your awareness as your relationship with them is changing. And what I would add to that is, and paying attention to that, and and understanding what does that mean? You know, if mm-hmm. if like you described, you know, it was an ungrounded relationship originally with the healer, and then you know, the angel settled and a lot of people would panic. My angel's settling. Oh my God, what's wrong? <laughs> you know, quick, take her to the shamanic ER. It's like, well, no, actually this is a good thing. <laughs> so what yeah. would you, 
yeah, what would you say in terms of cultivating right relationship, a good working relationship with archetypes? Well, for me, um, yeah, so I think it's a little hard question to answer. For, for me, what really allowed me to cultivate that relationship first and foremost was emotional clearing techniques because calling in to those energies into my emotional clearing sessions are where I first started to see them in action. Like, um, we can, anyone can, can have a basic sense of like, what does a warrior look like? What does the energy feel like out in the world? What is healer? What does a healer look like out in the world? And that, that can be helpful to start to look for those manifestations and expressions in the world around you of these larger energies and to see those patterns playing out. That can be very helpful. But for me, it was most helpful with seeing, oh, there's this issue in my life that relates to healing that I'm working with, here's how this energy, when I ask it for help, approaches that issue. And then that, in turn, when I take action on that advice from that energy, it deepens my relationship with that energy because I feel the difference between what that energy's natural impulse was to do in that situation versus what my ego's natural impulse might be to do in that situation. Um, so I think, I guess in, in calling on these energies in your journeys is a big help um, or in any modality you have to work within your inner landscape is also helpful um, and starting to then uh, ask those energies questions about situations in your life that have to do with the cosmic energies they embody so if you're being called into warriorship but like for example you have an issue of boundaries with someone you're clashing with someone and you might call in warrior and ask, what would it best serve my purpose in this moment to, to engage, to, to engage? How would you, how, how can I apply warriorship to the situation with this person? Um, and then in doing that, noticing what that answer is like, and then taking action on the answer and seeing how that feels, I think can be very helpful in deepening that relationship with, with archetypal energies. The other thing I think we found in the community about archetypes is they really love songs. Yes. <laughs> when we when we create songs that come from our relationship with them that honors what we're really receiving from them, especially the ones that really um, get it, really get um, our relationship with them and the singing of them, it just blasts open the relationship with that particular archetype. It's really kind of wonderful to see um i don't know do deities also like songs yes i think everyone likes songs <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's part of why we're here the humans yeah. is to make up songs for everybody um but, uh, so go ahead. I think another thing is um well dance is very helpful songs are very helpful but also uh, there's there's just something about the the willingness to engage with these energies and ask them questions and experience them in your body i think is the root of of learning about them because, for example, it, it, taking Jung's work, what he thought was a misunderstanding of his work, is when people started to use his archetypes as a sort of astrology. Like, oh, yes. I am now in my eternal youth phase. Like, you know, that is who I am. You know, like, instead yeah. of what he, his purpose was something we actually haven't talked about yet, I'll talk about in a minute about the not the danger of getting fixed in an archetype. But what, what he was always doing was describing the ex intimate experiences he had as he was engaging these energies and working to get to their roots by asking them questions and experiencing them in his life and moving them out into his life through art and, and analysis. And so instead of taking them as a fixed thing, like oh, I am a healer, really questioning what does that, what does healer really even mean? Mm -hmm. Like what is this energy? And, and coming from a place like Christine said of humility of, of, of um, not ignorance, but openness, that, that openness to a new possibility, that being willing to stay on the edge of beyond words, beyond knowing, and, and notice what comes, and then take that word that comes back to the feeling in your body you're getting of this energy, and see if that's the best word, if there's maybe even a better word you could use, and, and continuing to, to sense into that energy in a deep way, rather than trying to leap to the, I know what this energy is, and this is who I am, this is who I identify with. And that's um, why the emotional clearing you're talking about is so important is is to to have our body become a more and more clear resonator with these energies and less and less full of the stories we've made up in our head <laughs> and in our past. Yeah. 
Yeah. So Langston, I can't believe this, but our hour has run its course. Wow. So I want to remind everyone that you can reach Langston at Langston at occupy dash your dash heart dot com. Um, and the same website, occupy dash your dash heart dot com. And that his next emotional clearing class online will be in July. Langston, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. So I give thanks to the Ancestral Helping Spirits for gathering around us and holding us so well. You have gratitude to the earth below and the sky above and the heart that unites us all. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>